the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, I don't wish to incriminate anybody, but two of the youngest residents of the rectory uh, have very selective hearing. It's sort of like you hear the government, that there's a few key words that if you say it over the phone, all of a sudden they tune in, but otherwise they ignore your phone call. Uh, it, if one might say on the way out from uh, 10 feet away, don't forget to empty the dishwasher before you go to school. Uh, invariably, it won't be heard. The same could be said for don't forget to take the trash out or the recycling out before you go to school. Almost never is heard for some reason. Uh, but they could be on the far section of the playground, and if you offered that last piece of cake to the other sibling, all of a sudden, you know, they're in the room. That's not fair. We can't do that. Selective hearing. My wife says there's a, uh, a genetic uh, antecedent to that that lives in the same household as well. Uh, and I think we're not only prone to selective hearing, we're prone to selective processing. We can deny what's right in front of our eyes so faithfully. We can know there is something deeply wrong with our bodies. We can know that there is something. And we can refuse to go to the doctors. Again and again, refusing, knowing uh, that there is something we need to take care of. But as soon as we see the doctor, it has a name. And as soon as it has a name, it has a reality. See, people do the same with their finances. They can be heading towards bankruptcy. Uh, realizing they are going down the tubes, but they still keep spending and keep paying membership dues and keep buying new outfits, denying that reality as if it changes it. People do the same in their marriages. Sometimes we see, but we'd rather be blind. It allows us to keep going in the gray. And I think that's what's going on uh, in the, with the disciples this morning. They would rather keep going than face a hard truth. You can understand that. And I think in Mark, we've got these three chapters that I think has got this coolest thing about it. Uh, and as soon as I tell you about it, you're going to say, Ben has no idea what cool means. Uh, but I love this thing. There's three chapters in Mark. And it's the three chapters that lead right up to Jesus heading to Jerusalem. So 8, 9, and 10. The eighth chapter starts with the feeding of the 4,000. And then it goes into this... Uh, healing story about Jesus healing the blind man. Rubbing mud uh, and, 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 and touching his eyes. Uh, and it ends with another story of healing of the blind man, of the healing of Bartimaeus. And in between these two stories about blindness being healed, we have basically the disciples being told three different times that Jesus must suffer must die in order to rise again. And each time they don't understand it or they reject it. And then there's more teaching. Uh, and then there's the other story again until they can see. It's sort of a large lived out parable within the context of Mark right before he heads, Jesus heads to Jerusalem. So last week we heard uh, Jesus uh, telling his disciples uh, what must happen and Peter saying, no, Lord, that can't be. And Jesus teaching. And then today, our story today takes place after one of the most glorious stories in all of Scripture, the transfiguration. Three of the disciples have been Jesus' special guests to see what triumph looks like. To go atop the mountain and see Jesus transfigured in dazzling white uh, with Elijah and Moses. And they say, this is what it's supposed to look like. This is what we were following. This is what glory looks like. Jesus and our sacred story all building to this. This is why we're following. Jesus, can we stay here a little longer? Can we set up tents? Can we stay here amidst the triumph? But Jesus says, no. We have to go down the mountain. And then they go down the mountain. And the first thing that happens when they get down the mountain is another healing story. And with Mark, each healing story has a parable wrapped up in, inside of it. And it's a healing story uh, of this child, this young boy, uh, uh, who is uh, in uh, absolute configurations. He's just, he absolutely is convulsing uh, and shaking and they believe he has demons and they can't get them out of him and they've tried everything, including the disciples. 
And Jesus is frustrated. Jesus says, you know you have the capacity to do this. Why didn't you heal this man? And they said, we tried. We just couldn't do it. We tried. And so Jesus, somewhat exasperated, heals him. And then the disciples afterwards say, Jesus, why weren't we able to heal? He says, it's because you didn't pray. It's because you didn't lose enough of yourself. And you thought the power was going to come from you and not from God. You didn't. Let yourself get small so that God could work through you and make you large and able to do incredible things. And there will be a time when I'm not with you and you are going to need to be filled with the power of God. And from that story, we get to what we have this morning, which is Jesus again uh, walking uh, with, the, with his followers and he's telling them again, you have to hear this. This is what's about to happen. I am going to suffer. They're going to arrest me. I'm going to... Uh, to die upon the cross, and then eventually I will rise again and triumph. And you can only imagine Jesus as the disciples, they're afraid to ask him any questions. They're afraid uh, either because they don't want to know any more truth, because they're perfectly content in the gray unknowing, uh, or because they don't want to be the first one to say they don't quite understand it. But really, I think it's because they don't want the answer. They don't want to know more of the truth. They go into this conversation uh, that seems entirely inappropriate given what Jesus has said. But sometimes you you watch children uh, and they respond what seems inappropriate to a certain moment because they can't handle the moment. We don't do the same thing. So Jesus asked them, what were you guys talking about after I told you uh, that I must uh, suffer and die and and rise again? And uh, they got quiet because they knew they were talking about something that really wasn't important to Jesus. So finally, Jesus asked them again, and they said, well, I guess we kind of got into an argument about who was the greatest. I said, Peter. He said, John. It's, you know. And Jesus says, you've you got to get this. You've got to understand that this is not about greatness. This is about being a servant to all. This is about being willing to put yourself after the needs of others. If you want to be great, be great at taking care of the least and the lost and the disenfranchised. If you want to follow faithfully, be willing to be a servant to make sure that every single person has the basic needs that they're entitled to. Concern yourself with the least if you want to be the greatest in following me faithfully. And then Jesus goes on to take a child. And don't think of what we think of a a child today. Uh, Think of somebody who's regarded as having no value. The same word for uh, for child is the word for slave because that person would have no value, no ability uh, to to matter in the world. Uh, Because over half the children never grew to adulthood, uh, children weren't, weren't considered a person. Jesus takes this child, holds that child in his arms and says, if you want to follow, if you want to understand what it is like to be a disciple of mine, then you welcome A child like this, as fully as you would an emperor, you welcome a child of mine into your arms, into your community, and you welcome me. Just as we baptize today, we also say, help us to all grow to realize that we are to seek Christ in all persons, that we are to find the God in all persons, that we are to honor the divine in each person we encounter and those that we don't encounter. We are to seek justice. We are to respect the dignity of every human being. So we baptize into that same truth that our yardstick is not going to be over who's best, who's richest, which church has the best attendance. It's going to be how fully do we seek Christ in all people? How much are we kept awake at night at those children of God who are disenfranchised, who are refugees, who are homeless, sleeping in their cars, who have much less or greater needs than our own. That's the yardstick. We know what it looks like. We've seen people who live sacrificial lives. We've seen uh, people who are willing to give everything, even their life, over to the service of others. We know that we are called to do it. So I think the bigger question, the bigger question for all of us is back a little bit farther in the story. When the disciples are hearing what Jesus is saying and are unable to respond. So let's go back to that moment. What is it 
that God is trying to tell us that we don't want to hear? What questions are we afraid to ask God because we don't know that we want to hear the answer? What realities do we prefer in gray instead of seeing clearly face to face? What is God trying to tell us that keeps us from fully living into that vision that God has for our lives? I wrestle with those questions. Why am I more buoyed by the number of people that show up in church than the boldness of which they leave through those doors at the end? Why do I get such satisfaction out of the stuff that I have instead of the ability to use that money to feed somebody else? Why do I make decisions that I know are not in concert with the person that God made me to be? Wrestle with those questions. Because I think Jesus is calling the disciples and all who follow to wrestle with those questions. Because until we answer them, we can't get to that service, that welcoming of all people the way Jesus took that child and cradled him in his arms. Amen.